the word LIFT to 797979. Finally, a formula that boosts total testosterone. If your results with Ageless Male Max are too intense, please decrease use. For your free bottle, text LIFT to 797979. Text L-I-F-T to 797979. Here we go ahead on NFL Live. Tom Brady, Ben Roethlisberger, Dak Prescott, OBJ all spoke this weekend. We react to what they had to say on a little overreaction Monday. And 80 days till kickoff. So we look back at the best number 80s to ever play. It is a star-studded list. Jerry Rice and Chris Carter headline the group. Welcome to NFL Live. Dan Graziano, Theo Yates. Uh, did I screw up your name right there? No, you got I, I felt, it. Did, did good. Dan Graziano, I, I came out a little weird. The great Damian Woody, of course. It's a great day to be on NFL Live. Does anybody know why? Why? Right there, baby. Oprah. We start with Oprah. As Tom Brady sat down with Oprah Winfrey for an interview that aired on Sunday, discussing a wide range of <laughs> topics, including his retirement. Here we go. Got it more now than I would than I used to. Yeah. I think now I, I think that I'm seeing that there's definitely an end coming um, sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. Um, what does that end look like? Is that 43? Is it 45? Yeah. Is it? As long as I'm still loving it. Still as long as you're loving it, you're going to do it. Yes. Yeah, so, as long as I'm, I'm loving the training and the preparation and willing to make the, the commitment. But it's also, um, I think what I've alluded to a lot in, in, you know, in the docuseries was there's other things happening in my life, too. All right. So after hearing what Tom Brady had to say right there, do we care to guess how many years, Dan, that Brady would have left? Change your opinion at all. Two? Two? I, I don't know. But that I, I doesn't change my opinion. I, I thought... You know, he's got this contract where he's got two years left on the deal, right? Yep. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Patriots made some kind of adjustment to his deal, which might extend it a year or two. But even if that's the case, I'm not sure that means he plays that long. So be 41 this year, play through age 42 and see what happens. Spent my morning listening to Adam Schefter's latest podcast that included Adrian Wojnarowski, of course. Plug! No, I'm just saying, we're good teammates here, right? You get a right? cut off and of that or both what? talked about how they don't like the deal in guessing. They're reporters by trade. So I think the reporter side of us says he's got two years left on his contract. All right. And the last time we saw this player on the field, he threw for over 500 yards against an excellent defense Mm. in the highest stakes game you could possibly imagine for a football player. We understand that two more years is the concrete plan in place because of the contract length. We also understand that he has other things on his mind besides his ability on the football field. So let's start with that two year time frame and then. I think just like the Patriots have not a moving target, but they understand they might have to evolve if Tom's desires change. For now, Tom says he's going to play for two more years or has a contract for two more years. That's the window that I think we should all be focused on. Yeah, I think that's a number for me. I mean, it's amazing when you have kids, what they, how they change the dynamics of the, of the whole thing. Your kids start getting older. They start tugging on your cape a little bit more if you're Tom Brady. And uh, that noise just grows louder and louder. So as great as Tom Brady has, you know, has been playing, you know, obviously won the MVP this past year, you know, those, those noises are only going to grow. So like you said, he only has two more years on his deal. I'm not going to sit here and guess, you know, how many more years Tom Brady has, but I would at least expect him to at least finish out the two more years and then reevaluate the situation then. So the contract has some, you know Brady well, does the contract matter in terms of how long he's going to play? Is it about Giselle, about the whole thing? Does contract even mean... No, I, mean, say, no, I don't think so. I, I don't think the don't contract think so. is the, the contract is not the the first and foremost right. thing. I think obviously, again, he's getting older. Yep. Kids are getting older. Yep. That's that's starting to play a bigger factor in this in this whole picture. All right, let's do a little overreaction Monday. Then we'll start with New England won't have their next quarterback before Brady retires. I think it's an overreaction. I, I think there are a lot of avenues for them to find one. If you talk about Brady playing two or three more years, that's two or three more drafts where they can find someone and develop someone. And I think even if he surprised them and retired after next year, we've talked about this before on the show, next year's quarterback market has a chance to be interesting in, in, in a non-draft way. There could be players that come off of good seasons and still don't have jobs with their same teams, you know, in places like Buffalo or Arizona. You know, like there are some interesting potential quarterbacks on the market next year. So I think the Patriots are in good shape. You look at this treasure trove of draft picks. 
to address that position whenever it needs to be addressed. Yeah, I think so as well. And I think that it became clear for the Patriots somewhat during the pre-draft process, but most especially during the first night of the 2018 NFL draft, that a quarterback of the ilk that they would want to invest in to become an heir apparent to Tom Brady probably wasn't going to be available to them. This was a very hot-button quarterback class in 2018. That much we know. And yes, there are already some concerns about the depth of the 2019 rookie quarterback class. But Dan just mentioned it. You get 12 draft picks. You've got three additional picks in the top three rounds and some flexibility to move up the board if need be. And I would be very surprised if next offseason, at this exact same time, barring their seventh-round pick, Danny Etling, this year being a surprise development, that if the Patriots don't go out there and find themselves a quarterback, whether it's a veteran who becomes available or one of these young rookies. Do we really expect Bill Belichick not to have a figure this one out? Of course. Out? <laughs> He's got I a mean, plan for everything. Yeah, I mean, listen, with all the draft capital that the Patriots have going into the two, two, 2019 draft, you know, obviously you would expect that position is going to be a glaring, you know, glaring need for the Patriots, something that a lot of people talked about that they might have done this past draft, but with all the draft capital that they have, I mean, it's – Almost 100% sure that the Patriots are going to do something about that position in 2019. This is a team that on the final day before they headed out for their summer vacation, they got extensions done with their fullback and their long snapper, which isn't to say those positions don't matter, but it's that they don't leave any stone unturned. If it's time to address a reinvestment in your long snapper, you make sure you do it when the time is right. The Patriots are as detail-oriented as there is front office, coaching staff, you name it, all facets of the organization. It, Always think. And they were very detailed with Garoppolo. They felt like they had their guy there, bingo, it was done, right? But then that, then he hey, hung around a little bit. So what happens if they win the Super Bowl this year, mm-hmm. Brady retires, off into the sunset, then what at quarterback? Well, that's where I start to look at situations where you, you could be looking at somewhat established veterans that could be available next year. If you don't want, you know, if you need a quarterback for 2019, Mm-hmm. And the 2019 draft doesn't offer you a start right away guy. And you're the, you're the Patriots. You want to continue to try and win Super Bowls. You know, a, a guy like a Tyrod Taylor could be coming off a big year and still not be the guy in Cleveland because they want to play Baker Mayfield. A guy like a Teddy Bridgewater could have played well in, 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 you know, for a stretch with the Jets and still not be in the Jets' plans because they have Sam Darnold coming. So there's a few situations like that around the league. That's where I, I say there are potentially several different avenues uh, for the Patriots to address this situation here in the next couple so of years. I was going to say, not to in any way connect them to the Patriots, but just an example of how veteran quarterbacks and their availability is going to define in some ways the chatter leading up to the 2019 offseason. Joe Flacco's a guy that people are already wondering, what does this future look like in Baltimore? Because we're already hearing about how Lamar Jackson is drawing rave reviews, comparable reviews during minicamp to Michael Vick in all the ways that you would want to on the field, right? The athletic ability, the cannon arm, et cetera. So there's going to be a bunch of veterans available next offseason. As we speak of quarterbacks, another quarterback who has flirted a little bit with retirement, 36-year-old Ben Roethlisberger also spoke this weekend at his football camp about his contract situation. I'm not going to be one that's going to sit here and worry about about contracts. That's not my job. My job is to play football. There's a lot more people that need to get their deals done now. So for me to do it two years out, if it, it, you know, if it doesn't make sense to the team, then I'm, I'm not going to sit there and worry about it's it. It's more about what we have right now, the team. It's hard for me to think about those things with two years out because right now it's about here and now. And I know in two years we've got other guys, Pouncey, Gilbert. There's other very important guys that are up too that, that I hope get taken care of because if they're not here, then I'm not here. Do you care about record-breaking contracts and things like that? Like I care about record-breaking. Super Bowl wins and things like that. That's more important for me. So here are the highest annual cash values among current quarterback contracts. Matt Ryan, Kirk Cousins, Garoppolo represent the top three. All of their contracts signed this offseason. As you can see, Ben Roethlisberger's contract currently ranks 12th among quarterbacks with an average cash value just under $22 million a year. How about a little overreaction Monday here? We do Big Ben. This is how it reads. Big Ben should be pushing for a new contract. I say overreaction. I agree with Ben. I don't think he should be pushing for a new contract. You know, 36 years old, two years left, well paid. Is he paid at the very, very top? Is he, is he, does he rank in contract, uh, you know, commensurate with his performance? No. He would be a top, what, three or four or five guy instead of number 12. But did the deal a couple years ago, and he has no reason to be unhappy with it, honestly. Um, I, I agree with him. I don't know. You know, he's, he's, he's talked about retirement. In, in two years might be all he's got left. Uh, and again, every time he talks about his future for the last year, he has talked about those offensive linemen. You heard him reference those. It's very important to him that if I'm going to keep playing, it's going to be because I have these guys in front of me that I trust. And as long as they're getting paid, I'm happy. 
overreaction, and we're, and we're sort of seeing a bit of consistency from Ben Roethlisberger in this regard, right? At one point, he, let's just be honest, criticized the team for using a third-round pick on Mason Rudolph, saying, we need guys that can help us right now. Mm-hmm. So here he is, once again, living in the moment, saying, we got guys that need to be paid. He is not, not naive to the fact that Le'Veon Bell needs to be paid, Pouncey needs to be paid up front. There are other players across this roster that are going to eventually need to be paid as well, and... Listen, I understand that NFL players and their desire for a contract is not normally rooted in what they have made in the past. But for Ben Roethlisberger, he can say, listen, after this season, 2018, I will have collected $183.6 million in cash value. It might be okay for me at the tail end of my career to say, you know something? Those Super Bowl legacies, will, or those potential Super Bowls will push my legacy beyond any dollar amount that I can make in the final few years of my contract. When he's, I, I know it sounds crazy. Only making $21.9 million per season. But still, it's not like this is not Brady at $14 million per season or something like that. Woody, is he talking this talk, though, and walking a different walk behind the scenes? <laughs> I've, listen, there's been a lot of things that Ben Roethlisberger has said that I've, I've come to the you know, conclusion that ah, I can't really, you know, he's probably just saying this stuff for the camera, but saying a whole different thing. But I actually believe Ben in this, in, uh, in this scenario right here, because how many, how many off seasons have we heard now from Ben you know, kind of talk about retirement or, you know, I'm done. He's been having these type of talks now for the, for the past few seasons. So I honestly believe that he really feels like, you know what? Let's take care of these core group of guys. Let's add to it and let's make one last run at a Super Bowl. I don't think he's really thinking about, you know, two, three years down the line. He's thinking about right here, right now with this team that they have because, quite honestly, they have a team that could represent the AFC in the Super Bowl. All right, let's get it to OBJ then. Giants wide receiver Odo Beckham Jr. spoke this weekend at his football camp when asked if the media would see him at the training camp. He replied, yes, sir. Oh, this is saying, will he be at training camp? Will he not be at training camp? The old dance. He said, yes, sir. Yes, you will. No holdout. That's the official quote from OBJ. Didn't say much, said that. Gets a stover reaction Monday, which reads, Giants need to extend Beckham before training camp. What say you, Dan? It's not an overreaction. They, the Giants need to extend Odo Beckham before training camp because – even though he plans to be there. We saw him this past week at mandatory minicamp. He was there. There's still an issue, right? Is he going to participate fully in the drills? Is he going to put himself on the field in a position where he might, you know, collide with another player, where he might be in position to pull a muscle, incur an injury that could put that contract at risk? If he shows up to camp with the deal not done, then it won't matter as much that he's there as it matters. It'll be this constant evaluation every day. What's he doing? Is he participating? Is it still an issue? They need to make sure this issue is cleared off their collective plate before they get to camp. Yeah, certainly. You know, not, not too many people have the Giants sort of pulse better than Dan. He knows the ins and outs of this organization very well and laid out a lot of the factors for OBJ. And I agree with everything you said. I'd also add, and I know that this is not the reason why teams are often motivated to get deals done, but... If they report to camp, let's say it's July 30th this year, and Odell Beckham Jr. has no contract in place, every single question to every single player is going to involve something surrounding his deal. It's going to grow tiresome quickly. In the same way that I think the Redskins and the organization and players maybe experienced some Kirk Cousins fatigue over the past few years, that I think in some ways, whether you believe Alex Smith is an upgrade or not, at least you won't have to answer all of these questions surrounding something that is out of the hands of all but about three people, right? In this case, it's the ownership group, it's GM Dave Gettleman, Odell Beckham Jr. and his representatives. It's To me, it is not an overreaction that a deal needs to be done. So, so, listen, so in summary of everything that everyone has said, do you want a distraction? You had all these distractions last year. Right. Do you want another distraction going into training camp? Pay the man. Yeah. Pay the man. Yep. He's been the best wide receiver in that 2014 class, which everyone in that class has been paid. So pay the man. So you can go into, go into training camp, not worried about that, and you can just focus on having a good camp and get prepared for the regular season. One thing to pay the man, but if the man's asking for quarterback money playing wide receiver – do you still pay the man? I don't think he's going to be asking for quarterback money. I think you can get this deal done. Right. Well, but, you know, to, to Damien's point, Sammy Watkins, Mike Evans, uh, you know, at the top of the draft, they've got deals. This is the 2014 draft. Brandon Cooks does not. But you look at other. Allen Robinson got Allen Robinson, season, who was the yep. second round. So uh, you, the, the template's in place. Jarvis Landry, the template's in place. If you give him a better deal in some respects than Landry got or Watkins got, I got a pretty good feeling that'll get it done. We'll see. We'll see. Everyone in the neighborhood knew about Bobby. 
Bobby the basketball boy, they called him. Bobby wanted to go pro someday, so he was always out in the driveway shooting hoops. But one day, his mom came out and told him, Hey, your wife wants you to take out the trash? His mom was visiting, and Bobby was a grown man. He had kind of missed his window. Plus, no one had ever seen him actually make a basket. But on the other hand, Bobby had heard how Geico could save him money on car insurance, so he switched and saved. So, it was all good. With Titans mini camps in the books, newly acquired running back Deion Lewis said this about the potential of a backfield that features both he and Derrick Henry. We feel like we can be the best duo in the league. All right, a little, little fighting word to start things off. I like it. There were three teams that had multiple 600-yard rushers last season, including Deion Lewis' new team, the Titans. The honor of best running back duo clearly belonged to the Saints, who got over 1,800 combined rushing yards from both Mark Ingram and Alvin Tamar. All right, that brings us to something we call more or less. They call it something a little different in the desert. More or less we go with. With Ingram and Kamara setting our benchmark of 1,800 rush yards last season, well, these duos have more or less. Damian, we'll start with you. Lewis and Henry, what do you think? I think I'm going to go more. I'm going to go more with, uh, hmm. with, with Lewis and Henry. Um, when I look at the Titans, I feel like they don't want to put as much on Mariota as far as his legs are concerned. This is a guy a quarterback who hasn't been able to stay on the field throughout his career. And I think you have finally have Derrick Henry, who doesn't have to worry about split, you know, splitting the role like he did with uh, uh, DeMarco Murray. I think now he's going to be he's going to be that guy that's going to be the bell cow. And Deion Lewis is definitely that change of pace type of guy that can not only run the ball, but he's going to be effective catching the ball as well. But I think they can get over that that 1,800 plus uh, rushing mark by Kamar and uh Ingram. And, and, and Ingram. Ingram. Yep. yep, yep, yep. All right, we'll go to Atlanta Field. Devontae Freeman and Tevin Coleman. What do you think? You know, I'm thinking back to that 2016 season. Historic in terms of production for the Atlanta Falcons. They were amazing. And yet, Devontae Freeman and Tevin Coleman did not even combine for even within 250 yards of the mark set by wow. Ingram and Kamara last season. So by that logic, I'm going to move over here to less, acknowledging that there is still a case for Freeman and Coleman as the best running back duo in the NFL, the way that they complement each other so well, and yet they can also both do a lot of the same things as the other player, makes them nightmarish to defend. But I think this Atlanta offense will be better this year. I'm just not so sure I can count on them being even better than they were two seasons ago and better by a significant margin, especially with all those passing game weapons. All those guys are going to eat this year. Julio, Calvin Ridley, Mohamed Sanu, a lot of mouths to feed. Best receiving core in the league? Yeah. I think it is, too. I think so. Brown's number two? <laughs> Not quite going there yet. They're, they're, they're close. <laughs> they're getting close. They're in the discussion, All right, though. Dan's up next, but first we have a little surprise for you. Take a look. Oh, we're going to play more or less. You know, I hate this segment because it should be more or fewer. Fewer is the correct well, grammatical. We've been through, We've this, been through this. More I was or hoping fewer. There were, I was hoping there'd be grammar in this segment. So, uh, we, we all more were. Yeah. Fewer. You're welcome. I'm going to say fewer. I want to say fewer. I know. Yeah. Listen, I told you to change the whole thing. I'm so proud. Everyone must answer in cliches. <laughs> as long as they're grammatically correct. They spent all morning trying to convince me to disagree with you. Tell, tell, the, tell we, the listeners We disagree why. with this right and wrong. Are we doing <laughs> the show in English or are we not? We're going to do it in English today. <laughs> tell English. them why. Tell them why. Why? Less or fewer? Yeah. yeah do a little English it, lesson. It's, a, it's, 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 it's less and fewer. Less is for a singular quantity. Yep. Fewer is for multiple numbers. So Give a number. Less... Are they going to have uh, less toughness this year? Right. Is correct. Less. Fewer yards is correct. Ah, Fewer. All right. Well, then, we then, we're, then we're back to less or more. Here you we can go. reach just one uh, person. So we're going to get into Latavius Murray and Dalvin Cook. Fewer or more? What say you, Dan? I say fewer uh, because I think that I don't think this is going to be like a two-headed backfield situation like a lot of these that we're talking about. I think Cook is going to be the guy. I think 1,800 yards is a lot to expect him. I think he's going to be very good, but they're going to throw the ball plenty in Minnesota too. Have a lot of balance, so I would say fewer for this duo. Uh, Latavius Murray probably more of a guy that, that kind of comes in when Cook needs a breather. I just don't see this being the kind of the kind of backfield that we're talking about that Ingram and Kamara were last year, that Freeman and Coleman were two years ago. All right, Dan, we'll do one more for you. What about Ingram and Kamara? Do they surpass that benchmark from last year? Or well, this not? is an easy one to say fewer because Ingram's only going to play 12 games. He's suspended for the first four, right. so I'm going to cop out there and say fewer. I, I just don't think, you know, g- given that, the fact that they're not both going to play the whole season, it has to be fewer. Plus, that was a monster number. 
I, I mean, just right, want to I shout mean, out Miss Bogosia, my elementary school grammar teacher. Uh, thank you for all that you did. I apologize for not knowing the difference between fewer and less. But, but it wasn't you. your fault. But we you got great. you, Miss Bogosia. Bogosia, yeah, got, she we, was we great. Got you. We got Dan the Jam, Taking baby. Here we go. Last year with Ingram and Kamara became the first running back tandem to each have 1,500 scrimmage yards. Ingram, though, like Dan said, will miss the first four games of 2018. Tough cookies. So uh, Patriots, Patriots fans and Patriots fans, too, have no problem calling their quarterback the greatest of all time, and for good reason. Tom Brady, not so much. He sat down with the great Oprah Winfrey for an interview that aired Sunday. He addressed the top. I still feel like I'm in it. Ah. I still feel like I'm doing it. I still oh. feel like there's still more to be accomplished. I was practicing the last two days, like, you know, working on my technique, on my fundamentals, on my all the things with my training that I still feel like I can be better, be a percentage better. I played a long time. Mm-hmm. It's not like you go, hey, man, I'm going to become yeah. you know, something different. No, I am what I am. I know my strengths. I've improved on some of the weaknesses. And I still think I want to go out there and compete and play with a bunch of 22-year-olds. And, <laughs> you know, it's still a lot of fun. All right, that gets us now to a little overreaction Monday. This one reads, Brady needs no more. To be the go, no more. I mean, five Super Bowl titles. I mean, what are we? Uh, what what more do we need to see here? I, I guess he could end up ranking atop some statistical lists, right? And that's p- still possible. Although I think Drew Brees will give him a run for his money in those categories. Yep. But uh, no, I mean, look, we, we judge these quarterbacks on whether they win and how much they win, and no one's won more than this one. Right. We it's it's not an overreaction, and as Dan said, we judge them by how they how much they win. In a lot of ways, that's through the prism of Super Bowl rings. He's got five already, and I think none of us would be surprised if he adds to them. But let's say he stays at five. It's not just the five Super Bowl rings; it's the fact that this team has stayed relevant since two thousand and one. Two thousand and one. We're talking about nearly two decades of sustained success in a league in which. It is set up to turn over mm. every handful of years. Like, this does not happen. This is not like the NBA where it takes just a nucleus of three to four players to become a three-time out of four NBA champion. The NFL is set up for teams to regress and regress rapidly. The Patriots have done the exact opposite of that. To me, not an overreaction. He's literally been to, like, Super Bowl half his career. <laughs> I didn't think, think about how crazy that is. Like, literally almost half his career, he's been to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that, that number is just mind-boggling to me. So, no, it's not an overreaction. Not an overreaction at all. LeBron's been to a lot of championships, too, and he's not the, the goat. I feel like he's he the most be. unanimously accepted greatest of all time. Tom Brady? Yes. I think Wayne Gretzky probably takes that okay. crown, right? Okay. right? Hockey yeah. blood. No, I see your point. I understand Maybe your right. point here, right? Maybe like right. that, um, listen, I think Tom Brady's case has been cemented further because we keep talking about his resume to this point being good enough. And again, like he could put the icing on the cake with two Super Bowls in the next two years, and none of us would be surprised. Right. Not a bit. Yep. They'll be a favorite to go to this year's Super Bowl again. To Damien's point, he's played in uh, more than 15% of all Super Bowls ever. Right. I mean, 12 of them were Six. played before he was born. Right? I mean, so, I mean, think about it that way. I mean, that's crazy, it's right? Crazy. That's, yeah, he's, he's done things that, that probably no one will ever do again in terms of yeah. that. Because to Field's point, you know, not just – Relevant since 2001, but 11 wins, 12 wins, 14 wins. I mean, every single year, excellent at a high level without taking a year off. Uh, remarkable. And it could be that he ends his career at the point where he's still capable of playing at a high level. You know, there are other quarterbacks or other players that have said, I'm going to keep going until 32 teams tell me no. It seems like Tom might be different in that regard. He might be willing to step away because it's his time. It's not what everybody else is telling you. Well, and the young man's game. Who won the MVP last year? A Tom 40, Brady. A 40-year-old. Shout out Wayne Gretzky. In the same interview, they, they, we're still trying to figure out where this interview was. They're sitting somewhere. Yeah, where are they? Is it I don't his know. house? Or? I don't know. <laughs> Brady addressed his relationship with head coach Bill Belichick. Here you go. Um, no, I mean, I love, I mean, I love him. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I love that he's an incredible, you know, coach, mentor for me. Um, and he's pushed me in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And um, like everything, we don't agree on absolutely everything, yeah. but that's relationships. All right, overreaction Monday we go. Bill Belichick has pushed Brady too far. Overreaction or no? 
I say it's not. Although I think it's funny how like it was hard for him to say the word love, right? It's like the Fonz when he used to say like I'm so 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 so, you know, right? <laughs> I, 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 I think they do probably love each other, but in any relationship like that, there's there's ups and downs, and it does seem to be that they're in a little bit of a down right now, right? I mean, yep. he's not going to the off season workouts, but no, not an over. It, 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 it's it's an I'm sorry, it's an overreaction to say he's pushed him too far. Because the results are still there, right? If they weren't still going to Super Bowls and winning Super Bowls, then you might be able to say that. But we'll know he's pushed him too far when Brady cracks or retires or they stop winning 12 games every year. Yeah, to me, it's an overreaction, in, sort of in the highest order. I mean, listen, we have seen organizational player relationships deteriorate to the point that a player needs to leave. Uh, uh, NBA fans are like Kawhi Leonard in San Antonio right now. That, to me, is a sign of a fractured relationship that is beyond repair. With Brady and Belichick, are they best friends? No, but you know something? As we just talked about, as Damian said, they go to the Super Bowl like every year. And Tom Brady threw for over 500 yards in the Super Bowl. To me, a complete overreaction. I do have more important information right now from a well-placed authority. That interview took place in Oprah's backyard. I want to get invited to a mixer of some sort <laughs> okay. in that backyard because that looks delightful. Who is the source on that? That is unbelievable. Not, not gotta worry about it. That is unbelievable. That's your insider coming out coming out <laughs> you in you right now. You couldn't wear your flip flops though. There's all those wood chips. You'd, <laughs> have, a, you'd have a problem that's there. That's a good so, point. Yeah, yeah that, that's definitely an overreaction. Listen, they're not gonna they're not gonna be going to ice cream socials together and all that type of stuff. <laughs> that's not the type of relationship that they have. But you know, to what Dan was taking, what Dan was talking about, you know, coach's job is to push you, you know, keep pushing and pushing you more, maybe more so than where you think you can go. And the fact that. Here's Tom Brady, 40 years old, wins the league MVP. You know, over his career, he's been to eight Super Bowls. I mean, to me, if you look at the whole picture, you know, that's what you, that's what you, as a player, that's what you want from any coach to be able to push you the way that Coach Belichick has, has pushed Tom Brady. So, like I said, their, their, their relationship is unique, but no, I, it's an overreaction. It's one of the great source pools of all time, right? That's one of the great ones. All right, Cowboys quarterback <laughs> Dak Prescott also speaking this weekend while watching undefeated welterweight champ Arl Spence Jr. He had this to say about the expectations for the Cowboys coming into this year. We're going to be an exciting team this year. Um, a lot of new faces. Uh, and I think that's what you're going to find is you're going to find out a lot of new guys uh, that we have on this team within this organization that can make plays. So, uh, you know, just uh, plan on surprising a lot of people. All right, we'll use Dak words then. Overreaction Monday, it reads, Cowboys are going to surprise people. Overreaction or no? I, I mean, I say, what? I, I don't think they're, they won't surprise me if they're good, right? So not an overreaction. I, that's the idea. His point is, we'll be good, we'll surprise people. They had a down year last year. They went 9-7, and seven, right? Everyone should have that as their down year. There's a formula there. The offensive line is intact. The running back is supremely talented and slated to play all 16 games this year. Problems at receiver, tight end, sure. Defense has to be put together like it does every year, but I expect the Dallas Cowboys to be a contending team this year, uh, and that will not be a surprise to me. Right, and not an overreaction to me as well, and Dan kind of laid it out. Everybody's pointing to the lack of weapons amongst pass catchers in Dallas right now. Well, we understand the confines of success for Dak Prescott, which we saw in 2016. And you know what it was? Dominant offensive line, dominant running game. And I know my guy D. Woody likes to see people like Zach Martin get make, making $14 million per season. Man, boy, the do I love it. playing the wrong yeah. era, my friend. Born too the soon. offensive line is still dominant. Zeke Elliott is going to play the entirety of this season. And I think that sometimes... When you hit a low, which, again, is a very relative term for Dak Prescott based off last season, it gives you far greater perspective as a player and the coaching staff. They know how to best utilize this pack, and a lot of it will be finding out what did not work last season. Yeah, listen, it, it, this is not an overreaction for me because, you know, one, they're going to get the, you know, Zach, going to get Zeke back for all 16 games, yep. and that's their identity. If you look at, if you look at the, how the Dallas Cowboys are built, they're built around the running game, they, when they run the ball, the defense stays fresh. They're able to get after people. So now that they got the line, the running back all intact, and also I think Dak Prescott's been hearing all this noise. He had a down year last year. Is Dak for real? You know, you got to start playing towards that, that contract. So when you combine all these things, I think Dak is, Dak is out for blood this year. I think Dak wants to prove a lot of people wrong, that saying that, oh, with no, you know, no Jason Witten, no Dez questioning his ability at the quarterback position. 
I think Dak's going to bounce back this year. I mean, us having to ask, are the Cowboys going to surprise people? It's probably not a great question for Dallas. They shouldn't be surprising people at this point. Are they going to make the playoffs, though, Damian, do you think? <sighs> hmm. Now, that's, that's a really good question. I don't think they make the playoffs this year. I, I, that's, a, that's going to be a very competitive division. The NFC is very compelling. I think the Giants will be better. I think that I think the Washington Redskins actually upgraded their quarterback. I think they're going to be better. I don't know if Dallas is going to make it this year, um, but I do think Dak is going to be a better quarterback this year as opposed to last year. Are they capable? Unquestionably. Will they? I don't believe so because the strength of that conference is the depth. The Packers and Vikings look like good bets. Carolina, New Orleans, Atlanta in that division. We know that the Rams were legit last year, maybe even more talented. And, oh, by the way, Jimmy Garoppolo still hasn't lost as a starter in the NFL. And, look, the Eagles are the favorites to repeat in the NFC East and should be. Yep. But no one has repeated as NFC East champions since 2003 and 2004. You know, just because the Eagles look like on you know, June 18th that they should have no, no trouble does not mean uh, that they won't have some degree of trouble. Someone else, the history tells us someone besides the Eagles will win the East this year. Could be the Cowboys. I like Washington a little bit, too. Yeah, I, listen, as a person that won a couple of Super Bowls, I know how that following year works. Every team is going to play the A game against the Eagles. They're, they look really good on paper. But, man, when everyone plays the A game against you, sometimes you tend to – Take a little bit of a step back. And we all think the Giants are going to be better, but I was looking at their schedule today. They started oh. home against the Jags, Dang. at the Cowboys, at the Texans, home against the Saints, at the Panthers, home against the Eagles, and then at the Falcons. It's crazy. I mean, it's that's one, a it's jump. crazy. Well, it's one thing to be better. I mean, jump. but the Giants were six games worse than the Dallas Cowboys last year. That's a lot to make up, especially <laughs> if you expect the Cowboys to be improved. So the Giants could be better and still have a ways to go. Shout out to our producer, Susan. Here we go. Here's an early look at the potential 2018 playoff picture. So Texans, Chargers, Packers, Ravens, and 49ers, new to the mix. Panthers, Titans, Bills, Chiefs, and Falcons out. Let me give you a little perspective here. The basis for this, more than 20 of our insiders, analysts, they voted on five teams that would be in, five teams that would be out. Why five? 20 of the past 22 years, at least five new teams have appeared in the playoffs. Last season, there were eight New to the playoff picture. After going 4-12 and last season, it's been all about getting healthy for the Texans this offseason after putting up big numbers as a rookie. Watson continues to rehab from torn ACL, suffered in November. He's not the only Texan coming back, though. J.J. Watt missed the final 11 games of the season with that broken leg. You all remember Watt has now missed 24 games over the past two years. Houston's big acquisition was signing the Honey Badger, baby. Tyron Matthew to a one-year deal. Matthew is coming off his season, his first season, without missing a game in his five-year career. And in April's draft, the Texans did not have a single pick in the first two rounds. Houston took safety Justin Reed out of Stanford with the 68th overall pick in round three. All right, so we'll, so we're now going to look. You had four wins last year. You had a healthy Watson for part of the season. Then Watson, of course, leaves the lineup. If Watson's back and healthy and rolling, how many wins does it result in for the Texans? Mm. Ten. Wow. So you're adding wow. six wins. I'm adding. I'm plus. Total. Yep. I'm plus. Plus six here. I, listen. Wow. The, the, the AFC. The AFC South mm-hmm. is a very interesting division. Very competitive. Obviously, Jacksonville and the Titans, and, and with Andrew Luck coming back. But I mean, the, the players that that the Texans are getting back. You know, JJ White. You know, Whitney Merciless. You know, obviously Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson was arguably the face of the league for that period of time that he was playing. That's that's how explosive that that Houston Texans offense was. If he can stay healthy, which that's still a big question mark, him staying sure. healthy for 16 games, this is going to be one of the most exciting teams in the National Football League this upcoming season. Bill? I'm, I'm slightly, ever so slightly less optimistic. I go five extra wins for nine in total. And Damian made the point that, listen, you can make the case that the biggest quarterback injury return this year in the league is Deshaun Watson, Tyler Hammer, Aaron Rodgers. But you could also make the case amongst non-quarterback injuries, they have the most returning talent of guys that missed a bunch of time last year. J.J. Watt, Whitney Merciless, two of the best pass rushers on their team. Now, Genevieve and Clowney is not coming back from a season-ending injury, but he's currently injured. So all these guys being healthy and on the field will make a huge difference. And remember this, they re-triggered this offense on the fly last year. 
Tom Savage, believe it or not, did start the season at quarterback. Now with a full off season to design things and scheme them up, even if Watts is not fully healthy, imagine how creative this offense can be this season. Yeah, I agree with the big improvement for Houston. I'm right there with Field on plus five. I mean, it would be tempting to go higher, but you have to factor in that AFC South. Yeah. I mean, you have two playoff teams last year that were not the Houston Texans. There's no reason to think either one of them won't be as strong as they were last year in Tennessee and Jacksonville. You could even make an argument that one or both of them could be better. Yeah. So I, I think you look at that, still maybe some questions on that offensive line, right? I mean, that, that left questions. tackle situation Major. is not a, is not a hundred percent there, but if they can get that figured out and they have someone in Deshaun Watson that can make things happen, maybe even when the protection isn't perfect, it could be a fun and exciting team. Look, when <laughs> Bill O'Brien has, has not had a settled quarterback situation since he's been in Houston, right? right. I mean, like yeah. it changes him all the time. He is dying for a year where he has one guy start all 16 games. And if he does, I think, you know, he's probably shown enough of an ability to be in the playoffs and win the division. Watson was awesome. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Any worry, though, Damien, I'll come to you. You have plus six. You have ten wins. Any worry that we're crowning him king too soon? How much pressure is now going to be on this man? I mean, he was he was really exciting last year. There was no question. In that little short sample size, um, I, I just think that this guy's big time. I really do. I kind of go back to what Dabble Sweeney said coming out, with, with him coming out of uh, Clemson. It's like He's like the Michael Jordan. Like he, he was basically telling everybody, you pass on this kid, you're making a mistake. We saw a glimpse of that last year. The biggest thing for him is availability. If he's available second, you know, second year, having the whole offseason to design and, and, and get more acclimated, Watch out. There, you know, there are NFL people who tell you Nick Saban is the only college coach doing, you know, showing you NFL looks on defense right. in college. Watson took it to him twice and right. beat him once in right. national championship games. Tells me he's got something that he's might work it. at the NFL yep. level. His 19 touchdowns, 19 passing touchdowns last season were the most by any player through their first seven games. Now on ESPN.com by the great field Yates, the biggest roster decisions for all 32 teams here are the contract Related roster decisions from Field Story. The Ravens and C.J. Mosley. Steelers, Le'Veon Bell. Texans with Clowney, Jags, and Dante Fowler. Titans with their, their tackle and Taylor Lewan. Raiders, Khalil Mack. Giants, OBJ. The Packers got to figure something out with Aaron Rodgers. And the Vikings, the spring 2019 group, of course. Barr, Diggs, and Hunter and the Rams with possibly the best defensive player in the entire league. Probably has my money in Aaron Donald. Welcome in now to the Verizon Film Room. So as we look through that list, which would be the toughest to resolve for said team, do you think? I'll go with Atlanta. Let's start because obviously it's multiple players. It's Jake Matthews on the offensive line. It's going to be a heavy tackle market next offseason or potentially before this season. Might be $14 million. Grady Jarrett, their defensive lineman, enters the final year of his rookie deal. A former fifth-round pick could be looking at somewhere between 9 or $10 million. And Julio Jones is unhappy. And you can make the case that with three years left on his deal, he should not be the priority at this moment. Agree. I mean, yeah. Okay, a lot of, lot of dominoes to fall in that Atlanta situation. Yeah, no question. What do you guys think? What about Le'Veon Bell? Yeah, for me, Le'Veon's the toughest one. I, I just don't see how this deal gets done in Pittsburgh. I mean, they have till July 16th to do something, so only a month to go. The way the Steelers structure their contracts, they don't guarantee anything really beyond the signing bonus. He's going to want a monster deal. His franchise number is already at 14.5, which is way beyond where the rest of the running back market is. Just don't see where the middle ground is to get a long-term deal done. Maybe I'll be surprised, but I think that's the trickiest one. Damien, where are you looking? I'm going with someone you mentioned, Aaron Donald. And you would think that this would be kind of, you know, the easiest one, the one you can hit out of the park. But Aaron Donald, the guy who held out into the regular season last year, still hasn't gotten paid. And if you're Aaron Donald right now, why in the world would you try to, why would, why would you sign a contract when you got Khalil Mack, you got other guys sitting out there, you want to wait until those guys are done, then come behind them and, and try to get, get the biggest deal out of all of them. Let's do some quarterback-related storylines from Fields' article. The Bills, Josh Allen, got an old timeline going on. The Dolphins have Tannehill's return. The Jets, the quarterback shuffle. Eagles, Carson Wentz. Bears with Trubisky. And the Cardinals, do they go straight to Josh Rosen? Which of those is the toughest for you, Fields? The last one you mentioned, the Arizona Cardinals with Josh Rosen, because it's going to be about resisting temptation. You give Sam Bradford $15 million guaranteed, it would signal he's probably the starter. But the early returns on Josh Rosen are very promising. A lot of people felt as though amongst the five first-round quarterbacks, he was the most NFL-ready. And 
Listen, I understand that you paid Sam Bradford a lot of money. It's not about conceding a mistake, but it's about putting the football team first, and that might be where Josh Rosen offers the best immediate value as a starter. I'm going to say it's the Jets. You know, they draft Sam Darnold. They signed Josh McCown. They signed Teddy Bridgewater. They got kind of a three-way thing going on here, but... You know, I, I have a lot of Jets fans in my neighborhood. You know, they they want to see Sam Darnold. They want to know when he's going to play. That pressure from the outside, from the fans, factors in here in terms of the Jets' decision as an organization. Damian, what about right up the road, Buffalo? Yeah, yeah I'm going with Josh Allen. Listen, he, a lot of people thought going into this thing, ah, well, maybe Josh Allen takes a year, you know, six for a year, and then we'll look at 2019. But you hear from Shady McCoy, you know, just talk glowingly about Josh Allen and, you know, being a smart guy. And obviously we know all the physical attributes that he brings to the table. The other two quarterbacks don't, don't really have that much playing experience. So Josh Allen could factor into this starting quarterbacks mix this training camp. No doubt. Six rookie quarterbacks started a game last season. Patrick Mahomes. Undefeated, 1-0, was the only one of those with a winning record. Hmm. How about that? A little number for you. Time for a little Sometimes. press coverage. Tweet 30, we call it. As we go, we have a little questions that are still unanswered from the Bengals that they are hoping to resolve. Cincinnati's first-round pick, Billy Price, tweeted this earlier today. Fully cleared for football again. Price injured his pectoral while bench-pressing at the Combine and was hoping to be cleared before training camp. There you go. Here's an early look at a potential 2018 playoff picture. Texans, Chargers, Packers, Ravens, and 49ers new to the mix, meaning Panthers, Titans, Bills, Chiefs, and Falcons out. The basis for this, here's how we did it. More than 20 of our insiders and analysts voted on five teams that would be in and five teams that would this year be out. Why five? 20 of the past 22 years, at least five new teams have appeared in the playoffs. Last season, there were eight new playoff teams. All right, so they make the playoffs for the first time in nine seasons. They win a playoff game. Then they fire their head coach, Mike Malarkey. They replace him with former Tennessee defensive coordinator, excuse me, Texans defensive coordinator, Mike Vrabel. The most notable signings for the Titans in free agency were a pair of former Patriots. They gave Malcolm Butler a five-year deal worth over $60 million and also brought in Deion Lewis, who's been awesome in New England. In April's draft, Tennessee took linebacker Rashawn Evans with the 22nd overall pick in the first round. Evans was one of just four total picks for the Titans in the draft. And now the big question is if the team can work out a new deal for Taylor Lewan, the great tackle. Tennessee's starting left tackle skip minicamp as he is seeking a long-term contract. All right, so talk me through the, uh, the thought process here. Anybody surprised that Tennessee is on their way out? I mean... It's, for me, the thought process was we got to give them five, right? And I didn't like putting the Titans out. I, I you know, I'm, I'm trying to think. Five was hard to get to. Like, do I want right. to take the Eagles out because it's tough for a Super Bowl champion? You know, but I, right. I feel like probably would have got some abuse for that. Uh, but uh, no, I think the Titans. If you want to say the Houston Texans will be better, uh, the, the San Diego, uh, sorry, the Los Angeles Chargers will be better. You know, the, there might be some AFC teams on the come, so you got to take some AFC teams out. I don't know. Is Mike Vrabel, are we sure he's going to be able to be a head coach in a league? He's, he's new at it, right? We, we have high hopes for him, I think, but we're still not certain. The Taylor Lewan situation is one that hangs over their heads and is an important one. So there were a couple of reasons, even if you don't really believe in it, to make them one of your five. Recall the thought process here. We have five teams that we have greater optimism about this year than we did last season. That has to come at the expense of five other teams. This is not so much an indictment on the Titans as it is a reflection in our confidence in Deshaun Watson. Now, if you're going to point as to what the hangup might be for Tennessee, I think it's important to note that as he enters his fourth pro season, Marcus Mariota is still searching for consistency yep. as a decision maker and operating from the pocket as a passer. I think while there are quarterbacks who can do great things with their legs, I think the ones that sustain over time are those that can beat you with their legs but operate best when throwing from the pocket. And for Marcus Mariota, I still want to see a bit, me, a bit more before I say with certainty, okay, he's a quarterback that can carry you consistently to 8, 9, 10 wins, and he posts his appearance almost every year. I know for me, I could nitpick the Titans, but I just felt better about other teams, to be honest. Mm. I, I, and again, it's not an indictment on the Titans. I just, like, I feel good about the Chargers. Like, I think this is the year that they'll put it together feel good about the Texans. Not to say I don't like the Titans. Wide receiver, you know, they got questions at wide receiver. Fields, you talked about it, the quarterback. Can he stay on the field? Can he 
be cons- you know be consistent out there on the field. And I think that's for me. It's just it's I like other teams maybe a little bit more than the Titans right now. How does Vrabel fit in there for you? I love Mike Vrabel. Yeah, I am I am a Mike Vrabel fan. Mike Vrabel, we were teammates in New England for a few years, and you're talking about one of the smartest, hmm. highest football IQ guys you will ever come across. This guy is a teacher. He knows how to relate to players. And he'll get that, he'll get that whole thing the way he wants it done. And I, and I think one of, the, one of the really good hires is uh, Dean Pease because they both think, you know, they both have similar mindset. So he doesn't really have to worry about that side of the ball, hmm. which for a first-year head coach, is a really, that's a really good thing. It's Monday. Let's do what we do. Let's do what we do. Overreaction Monday. Hmm. So the NFC South did it last year. Can the AFC South do it this year? The AFC South will have three playoff teams this season. Overreaction or no? I say it's not an overreaction, even though we just you could detect there's not a lot of conviction in the uh, Titans as one of the five out, right? right I mean, right. not only did it have two playoff teams last year, those two playoff teams went three and two in the postseason, including road wins by Jacksonville and Pittsburgh and by Tennessee and Kansas City. These aren't just fluky teams. I mean, they're teams that know how to win a little bit. So yeah, I don't think it's an overreaction. I think it's entirely possible that last year's two go back to the playoffs and Houston joins them. I'll go overreaction only because I think the two teams from the AFC West will make the playoffs this year. I still believe in Kansas City, and I do believe in the L.A. Chargers. The process of elimination, all of a sudden you're down to just one wild card team in the AFC South. And I'm going to piggyback field. It's, uh, it's not overreaction. Well, it is an overreaction for those same reasons. I, just, I feel very good about L.A. Chargers and the Kansas City Chiefs. I think Andy Reid, they get the defensive side fixed. The Chiefs will be back in the playoffs. What would a successful season look like for Indianapolis this year? To you? Oh, goodness. Andrew well, Luck, Andrew Luck plays 16 games, right? Yeah, as simple as that. <laughs> That's what it that, would be. Yep. Yep. But they've yeah. got the right staff, really good young offensive coordinator, Nick Sirianni, leading the way. They're going to be in good shape long term. So keep perspective in mind. Patience is tough to find and, in the NFL. And they're build, they seem like they're building this thing the right building it inside out, yeah. which is, I think is good for Indianapolis. Yeah. A lot, a lot of Bill Belichick history in the South, if you will. You have Bill O'Brien, Mike Vrabel now. You almost had Josh McDaniels. You don't have Josh McDaniels. Almost. But then you have guys that beat Bill Belichick in the biggest game. You have Frank Wright now, mm-hmm. who is an Indian. You have Tom Coughlin, of course, running the show with the Jags. So that could be uh, good for championship hopes.